want to drink that out of the bed and drink Christmas present to our Jesus Christ, Lord, that you get saved today. Lord, we just lift him up <coughs> through the message, through the song. Pray for those that are away from us today, Lord, whether it be for the weather or whatever. And God, just give us a great day in the Lord. And we can give you the honor and praise for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Hey, many people don't try to tie the cross and Christmas together, but in reality, that is one of the greatest reasons for Christmas is that the cross would follow. And I'm going to preach to you about that in a few minutes. Thank you so much, choir. What a joy to see you. Hey, uh, appreciate all of you. If you're visiting, we have a packet of information about the church and the ministry. Love to get one in your hand. Our ushers, greeters will do that. And if you'll fill out a guest card to put it in the, uh, over by the Welcome Center or give it in the offering plate in a few minutes, as it passes by, we'll have a record of your visit today. Church, stand, greet those around you as we continue now in our praise.
Let's pray. Almighty God, as we gather here to worship you this morning, Father, that song is a great reminder that each one of us brings an individual story, but that you are an eternal God, and you meet each one of us, Father, through your authority and through your power and through your love, and God, it's so represented and it's so shown and it's so experienced through Jesus Christ coming to this earth that we could see who God is. We can know how God acts. We can understand God's love. Father, we praise you for that. We thank you for his mercy. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather here to, today around friends to uh, be encouraged and also, Lord, to remember your faithfulness to us as you have been faithful to so many. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Still, shepherds watch from a hill. I close my eyes, I see the night when love was born. Perfect child, gently waits. Mother bends to kiss God's face. I close my eyes. I see the night when love was born. Angels feel the midnight sky. They see.
Thank you, Brother Taylor. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Also, if you would, take your finger and turn it to Genesis chapter 3 and put your finger there or a notepad. We'll spend a few minutes in Genesis chapter 3 as well. Uh, very important that we try to tie these two events uh, so closely together as our Lord would give a prophecy concerning what is taking place, okay? The subject matter, if I could title it, would be a Christmas return to Jesus. And what we find also is three Christmas gifts. And coming, uh, uh, using a, a backdrop of Galatians chapter 4, and then moving uh, through that passage, okay? Galatians chapter 4. And we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 3. Uh, Galatians 4, 4 said, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive uh, the adoption of sons. Uh, in Galatians chapter 4, what we discover is there's a reference made uh, there to the incarnation, okay? And we see that when he said, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. Now you and I know the real reality of that is that He was uh, born of a woman, but He was not made of a man, okay? I'm not going to go back and try to remind you about the virgin birth, other than the virgin birth gives us a perfect Savior, and uh, as we look at that today, we had to have a perfect Savior. You know, one time David was a Savior to Israel, if we wanted to say it that way, because David went against Goliath, and as he went against Goliath, the Philistines fled, and therefore you know that when David goes back to town, he's marching into the city streets there, that some would say David uh, or Saul has th slain his thousands, uh, but David has slain his ten thousands. David uh, was a type of the, the Savior. Well, there was a time when we could even look at Samson as uh, mean as he was and as bad-spirited as he was. There was a time when Samson was like a Savior in his death. If you remember, he got between two pillows and he was able to push them outwardly. And again, it said he killed more people in his death than he did in his life. Day, uh, Samson became a type of a Savior. When we look at this particular passage, though, it talks about when the fullness of time was come. Time is of essence, is it not? Especially when you're going to have a baby. We have the Bennett baby. She stepped out with him. He's here for the first time today. I tell you, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth a son. Not only that, there are other ladies in here who are expecting, and I'll tell you exactly when the baby's going to be born, and that's when it's time, okay? Now, with the modern uh, access of C-sections, they can plan those things uh, a little bit differently. But uh, the Scripture tells us that Jesus was born at the right time, was He not? When I think about the timing of His birth, uh, you know the law prophesied 
that there would be a man like unto Moses? Uh, well, Deuteronomy 18.15 tells us, and you know what? The law was fulfilled in his birth. Did you know also that the books of history tell us the same thing uh, about the Savior going to be born? So therefore we believe uh, as we study the books of history that what we find is that the fundamentals of Scripture were accomplished. Not only that, but the books of poetry give us reference to Jesus being born, the incarnate Christ, uh, and we find uh, it likewise to be faithful. The prophets of which we spend more of our time with the Christmas story tells us about the place of His birth, tells us about the timing of His birth. We read the story last week from Luke 2, and it said the shepherds came, but then the shepherds went away rejoicing. Why? at this great thing that was done. Well, it's stated in this particular passage, when the fullness uh, of time was come. So I thought about that time. First of all, physically. Uh, Mary just happened to become, uh, to become so heavy with child, this particular outing to Bethlehem, uh, that she gave birth. Now, it just was not a coincidence. Uh, Taxes were to be paid, but the reality is furthermore that she had already, or the Scripture had already promised that the kid was going to be born in Bethlehem. So they didn't just journey over there to have a baby born. They journeyed over to pay taxes, and as a result of that, the child uh, was born physically, but also spiritually it was a dark time. I don't know. We read about the dark ages in history. We're living in some ways in the dark ages even now, are we not? Because there's spiritual darkness all around. I'm not talking about it prevails. I am telling you that the spiritual darkness, I think, is drawing even darker than it's ever been in our day. And as a result of that, we could call this a great time for the Lord to come again if it's similar. Also, politically, the Romans were in authority. And as a result of that, uh, the Scripture, if you'll go back and read the book of Daniel, what, chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, of which I have did this week, what you'll find there is the Lord had said that all of those empires would exist. Uh, and the Roman Empire was one of the cruelest uh, if you do a study on them. So politically, the time was right. And historically, I think, everything just lined up. Somebody would say, did the planets line up? I'll just say this, the signs lined up. And that was historically, politically, spiritually, and physically. The Lord said, now is the time. Well, it said, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. I invited you to turn back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. And the reason I wanted you to do that is I want you to see some things with me because in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, there is a word that is used uh, about our Lord. And that word there uh, that is used there talks about to redeem them that were under the law. And later we'll read in the book of Galatians also that it would tell us, Cursed is every man that hangeth uh, upon a tree. Well, the Lord came to redeem us. Aren't you glad for redemption? You say, oh, but it didn't cost much to redeem Him. It cost the precious blood of Jesus. It cost Him His life. You say, that was an afterthought. No, that was a forethought before the foundation of the world. It just so happens to be that that is the plan that our Savior, our Redeemer, our Creator drew up from the beginning of time. In, in Genesis chapter 3, we discover that there was a sin committed. You say, well, oh, I thought there were sins committed. No, originally there was one. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, the Scripture tells me, uh, well, verse 9, the Scripture tells me, the Lord calls to Adam and He said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the, thy voice in the garden. I was afraid. I was naked. I hid myself. He said, uh, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree wherein I commanded you you should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Both of them had an excuse. Adam was the one God confronted because, number one, he's the one he had gave the instruction to. 
Secondly, when Eve is confronted, she then passed the buck to the serpent. Hey, he beguiled me and I did eat. I want to tell you something about the serpent. He's just as crafty as he ever was. Matter of fact, uh, schematically, he probably has learned some new schemes. Uh, he, like our Lord, is not omniscient. He does not know everything. But he knew enough in the beginning because he was uh, an archangel or a head angel. And as a result of that, he decided he wanted to be as God. So therefore, he always would go after God's choice creation. The Lord said that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. Created he them, okay? So if you really want to break the, what I call the back of the Redeemer, hey, go for His choice creation. And from that we find these verses, verses 14 through verse number 21 or 24. See, we can look at this passage and see the person of the curse and the place of the curse in a perfect environment. But look at the problems of the curse. Verse 14 the Lord God said to the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. All oh, the Scripture would tell us in the Galatian letter to redeem them that were under the curse of the law. The law is not a cursed document. But we want to look at something today and realize that our Savior come to redeem us from the curse. So as we look at that there, the problems for the serpent was uh, he had to crawl around in his valley the rest of the days. Not the rest of the day, but the rest of the days. Verse 14 tells us, He said, Because you've done this, you're more cursed than the cattle, the beast of the field. Because of this, on your belly you'll go, and the dust you'll eat all the days of your life. And I'm going to do something, He said. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it'll bruise thy head, and you'll bruise his heel. You know what? The serpent's been nipping at the heels of the Savior's young uns forever. Right? Has he? Has he tempted you lately? Has he tried to test you lately? The serpent is not content with you just enjoying life. The serpent is also content that you'll enjoy the life that he can give. The serpent, though, he's after the Savior and has been from the time beginning. The Savior said to the serpent, the, the Master, the Creator said to the serpent, You're cursed. Because of this, verse 16 said to the woman, He said, I'm going to greatly multiply your sorrow in conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. Now believe me, there's been some people who have carried that verse way to the extreme. Your husband is not the Lord over you. Guys, get that out of our minds. We're the leaders over them. The Scripture tells women to love their husbands, as Christ, or husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. But also He's telling us that because of the sin in the garden, that childbirth would become painful and that the, there would have to be order and the establishment there would be that there's God is over all and then man is responsible to God and the lady is going to be responsible to the man. And you say, hey, preacher, I don't like to be responsible. I don't like God's order. You take that up with Him. But guys, don't think for a minute that just because you supposedly the head that you can kick the ball around. You can't do it. You know, God is faithful, isn't He? He said to the sons, I call them, verse 17. Look what he said to us, to the rest of us. Adam said, because, for, and unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and you have ate of the tree, of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not, eat, shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Oh, well, he got by easy, somebody said. He just cursed the ground for Adam's sake. In sorrow you'll eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, from dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. There's two mouthfuls in that verse. Not only you'll have to work for a living, it's going to be painful. He said also you're going to die. He said because you came from dust, and you'll wind up dust. Well, that's pretty hard. Somebody could get the idea right now that God was mad. God's angry. 
God really is angry with all sin, isn't He? Aren't you glad, though, He loves sinners? You know, if He hadn't have loved sinners, He'd have left Adam alone, wouldn't He? God had the ability to do whatever He desired, but God loves His creation. So you look at the person of the curse and the place and the problems of the curse. But I'm so glad there was a plan for the curse. Verse 22 said, The Lord said, Behold, the man has come as one of us to know good and evil. Now let's put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat. If he does that, the Lord sent him out the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. He drove the man out, placed at the east of garden, cherubims, a flaming sword, and turned every way to keep them away from the tree of life. I call that in my life, in my studious experience with the Lord, I call it one of the greatest things God ever did for us. Because if man that ate of the tree of life in a fallen condition would live like this tormented forever. But God said there's a better plan. You know, we all grieve when somebody dies, do you? I'll tell you something, it's far better than the alternatives. Getting back to Galatians chapter 4, what I want you to see with that today, I want you to see what the verse says. Galatians 4 talks about when the fullness of time was come, God sent his forth His Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. You know what? It's a great privilege to be a child of the King. Somebody said, well, I'd like to be born to royalty. I could drive any car like I'd want. No, you'd be miserable. Because then you couldn't go to the picture show without somebody having to be by your side to guard and protect you. I don't mind being poor, do you? Matter of fact, it has its privileges. When we don't have much, sometimes we know who to look to for what we need. Look what the verse says. What did I get? What do we get for Christmas? We get the Christ for the curse. Verse 10 said, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things, but are written in the book of the law to do them but that no man is justified by the law, but in the sight of man it is evident. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10, I just remind you folks, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God in verse 11. It's evident, for the just shall live by faith. That's only two verses there, verses 10 and 11. The law is not of faith, the Scripture reminds us, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. It is said there in verse 13, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I ran across an article this week in my Bible study, and it was written by Henry Morris, Ph.D., in 1998. Henry Morris said, By stretching the six days of creation into great ages, many evolutionists can pick up with the Genesis story of creation. But they, but they simply cannot tolerate the record of man's fall and God's curse as the cause of suffering and death in the world. The distinguished professor of philosophy at Colorado State University points out this problem quite explicitly. The real problem is with the fall. The real problem, he said, is with the fall. A prominent Christian philosopher, Michael Ruse, sees the problem better than most Christians. Either humankind is in a state of original sin or it is not. Then there was reason for Jesus to die on the cross. If it is not, Calvary has as much relevance as gladiator's death in the Colosseum. Either mankind is in the state of original sin or is not. If there was reason for Jesus to die, if there is not, Calvary doesn't have any relevance. You say, hey preacher, 
he happened to be born and during his 33 years of life it was purpose that he would die no it was purpose the scripture tells us in the book of beginnings that the serpent would bruise his heel if you would study the lineage of our Lord look at the various times all through the prophetical books at how the, how, how the serpent was constantly trying to destroy or detour the plan of God. I'm going to tell you one of the greatest experiences that we're going to find is as we celebrate the Christmas experience, and I'm not just talking about an event, I'm talking about as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus, look beyond what God had in its purpose. In other words, Henry Morris said, by diluting or ignoring the effects of the fall, one inevitably, though perhaps unintentionally, is undermining the very gospel itself. Another humanist further stresses this aspect, even gloating over that such accommodations are accomplishing. Three things I want to share with you quickly that this, that this Christmas story gives us. It gives us a Christ for the curse. We've got a curse, but we've got to deal with it. Somebody said, just deal with it. Enjoy it. No, you don't enjoy curses. You endure them. Have you ever thought about, hey, there's got to be more to life than this? This old serpent, the devil, he, he's trying to stumble us. He's trying to criticize us. He's trying to gain our lives every time the lady goes to the delivery room oh man I'm dreading this you say how do you know they say that well I think they ought to say that thank God for epidurals it made you forget all of that now what I want you to see is there's curse you say well preacher explain all it to us I can't explain that I read it but I believe it Every time you get up on Monday morning and you're the only one other than preachers who's got to go to work and say, hey, it's Monday. Remember, it's a curse. Not in the sense of it not being original. Adam and Eve had a wonderful, they had a wonderful first job, didn't they? Just tend to this beautiful, lush, perfect place. No thorns, no thistles. How many of you have to pull weeds out of your flower beds? Prune your roses? Y'all do. Come on. Christ came to redeem us from the curse. Sin is a reality. I could find that in verse 10. The results of that we could find explained in verse 11. No man is justified by the law. It's evident. The just shall live by faith. The redemption of that is in verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Jesus became a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree, or every one that hangeth upon a tree. You ever saw the curse as, you ever saw the death of the cross as a curse? We'd probably call it a lot of different things, like a penalty. We know in Christ's case he didn't deserve that. But the law did say about those people who were hanging on either side of Jesus, even one of them recognized it. What we're getting is due us. He's done nothing amiss. So we defend the law, do we not, and say the fellows got what they deserved. But let me remind you a little deeper, if we all got what we deserved, we'd already be dead. See, the Christ of the curse is Jesus, and He came to redeem us. Hebrews 9, 22 said, And almost all things are purged with the blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus' life, His death, the blood that He shed for our sin, my sin, satisfied God. 
That's why we sing songs like her. The old hymnals used to have songs like, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. Oh, man, you get that in four-part harmony, singing that, and what you have is a beautiful gospel message. Sweet as a song I'm singing today, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. You know, the Hebrew writer is talking in terminology, and the Paul the Galatian writer is talking in terminology the Hebrews could understand. Because there was a law given to where those people could be redeemed from their bondage that somebody else had, or that they had got sold, sold into. A next of kin could come buy them back, pay off their debts. I'll tell you what Jesus did. He redeemed us from the curse. Now the price was pretty steep, wasn't it? Cost him his life. We don't see that as a part of the Christmas story, or we, we might, but we don't talk about it. Preacher, that's getting too that, that's getting too gory. If Jesus didn't die for the cross, what else I mean if Jesus didn't come for the cross, what else did he come for? The scripture said to redeem us from the curse. Second thing I find as I study this is not only a cross for the curse, but the satisfaction for the Scripture. The satisfaction of the Scripture, or for the Scripture, if you would like to say like I just did. I find that in verse 14 again in the book of Genesis. And the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you have cursed above the cattle and the beast of the field. On your belly you'll go, the dust of the earth all the days of your life, and I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. See, the problem wasn't with the woman here, was it? The problem was with the seed of the woman. And it's talking about the Master, the Savior, the incarnate one, Jesus who came. John 1, 1 gives us record of that. He said, I'm going to put enmity there, and he's going to bruise your head. Now, that's more than a fist fight. Friend, the serpent kicking the heel of the Savior is more than throwing bottles at him. His intention was to thwart the plan of God. He just doesn't have the power to implement it. The satisfaction of the Scripture. The present curse has no eternal impact on believers. The present curse that's described in Genesis 3 has no e eternal impact on believers. Other than if you want to read into it a physical death. But if it were not for physical death, we couldn't enjoy the blessings and the bliss of the eternal life that's to come. See, the Lord said, I'm going to keep them away from that tree of life. And he said, Adam, let me tell you a little secret. You're going to die. You came from dust. You're going back to dust. Now, Adam could have worried about that, couldn't he, all of his days. He could have thought on it, could have dwelt on it. But he didn't. The satisfaction of the Scripture gives us the hope through life, the help through, I call it, focus. We focus on Christ and not the circumstances. Sometimes I just sit down and write a list of people that's going through something. You know what? I, don't, I hardly ever find a way to quit writing. Because whether we believe it or not, almost everybody's going through something. We call them circumstances. If we want to focus on our circumstances, we can just stay of all men most miserable. But I think these verses gives us hope to focus on the Christ of the curse. Lamentations 3.21 said, This I recall to mind. Therefore have I hope. It's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. His compassions fail not. 
They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good to them that wait on him for the soul that seeketh him. I was at Baptist Village Thursday afternoon. I was going down the hall seeing our members and just so happened when I was going down hall number three, <clears throat> there was this lady in her wheelchair and she was getting herself where she goes and there was somebody else in the room where she was fixing to go into, but all I could make out from what she was doing is she was praying. And I want to tell you, she wasn't just calling a few names. She was, I almost call it what we'd call praying in the Spirit. Not in a tongue, but she was praying. And she was telling the Lord about whoever she was talking about that he really needed a touch, and he needed it now. And man, she went on and on. I'm serious. It, it made me slow down and listen to her prayer. Because whether it was real or whether it was something that was in her mind, she knew who to call on. And friend, I want to tell you something. That was that that'll give you the that'll give you the that'll give you the chills. Because that wasn't that first, that lady's first prayer. Friend, I'll tell you something about her hope that day. Her hope was through faith. And her help was she had a focus, and that was in the Master. You know what? That was a Christmas present. Not to me, but to us. The Scripture satisfied in this Christmas season. A Christ for the curse, satisfaction for the Scripture, but the future for the faithful. You know, that's a guarantee for us. Let me remind you what he said. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, Adam. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field and the sweat of the face. Thou shalt eat bread till you return to the ground. It's a lot to look forward to, isn't it? So I said, Preacher, if that's the story, I'm checking out. I don't care whether you check out or not. That's the story. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, and dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. The present curse has no eternal impact on the believers other than physical death. The present dilemma is nothing compared to the future glory. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says this, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. We've got to find a way to get rid of the corruptible and to be clothed with incorruption. You know what? The Lord had it in His mind already, didn't He? Because He said, Adam, you have came from dust and you're going to return to dust. Then He locked him away from the tree of life where he couldn't get it. You know why? Because life eternal doesn't come through a tree. It comes through the Master. But you know what? It really does come through a tree. The tree of the Master. Scripture said, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. You know what Jesus did for me? He took my curse. And because the curse is not valid over the eternal aspect of my life, the physical will return to dust, but the spiritual will enjoy the blessings of the Lord forever. The rest of those verses of 1 Corinthians 15 tells you something like this. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Oh, my goodness, isn't that sweet? In the moment, in the twinkling of a night, the last trump for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. If we didn't have a Christmas story, there, should, there, there would not be the beautiful story of transition that we find in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin that we would be made the righteousness of God in Him. 
If you bow your heads with me, let me ask you. Are you going to meet Him in your fallen state? Or in your renewed state? If you don't come to Jesus, the Scripture said you'll die in your sin. The wages of sin is death. God is very faithful to allow us to die in our sin if we reject the Savior. As many as would come to Him gave He them power, though, to become the sons of God. He said about His own people, Trust Jesus. Lord, the flesh is weak, including mine. The Spirit is willing that's why Satan sometimes attacks us in the area of our spirit. But greater are you that sent us than he that's in the world. And therefore, Lord, I yield all things to you. God, cleanse and claim people for yourself today. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as you do? Brother Mike leads us on.